The indigenous religious beliefs of the Tagalog people sometimes referred to as anatism, or, less accurately, using the general term, animism, were well documented by Spanish missionaries, mostly in the form of epistolary accounts relaciones and as entries in the various dictionaries put together by missionary friars. Archaeological and linguistic evidence indicates that these beliefs date back to the arrival of Austronesian peoples, although elements were later syncretistically adapted from Hinduism, Mahayana Buddhism, and Islam. Many of these indigenous beliefs persist to this day, in syncretistic forms discussed by scholars as Philippine variations of folk Islam and folk Catholicism. Cosmology Unlike early Western religions, with their great emphasis on pantheons of deities, Religion among Tagalogs was intimately intertwined with their day-to-day -day lives, as Almosera points out, aside from their own social structure, they believed in an invisible society coexisting with their own. This society, they believed, was inhabited by spirits that included dead ancestors, deities, and lesser gods. Pre-Hispanic Filipinos honored these spirits with rituals and feast days because these supernatural beings were considered able to preside over the whole gamut of life, including birth, sickness, death, courtship, marriage, planting, harvesting, and death. Some of these spirits were considered friendly, others were viewed as tyrannical enemies. Ancient Tagalogs initially believed that the first deity of the sun and moon was Baithala, as he is a primordial deity and the deity of everything. Later on, the title of Deity of the Moon was passed on to his favorite daughter, Mayari, while the title of Deity of the Sun was passed on to his grandson and honorary son, Apalaki. One of his daughters, Tala is the Deity of the Stars and is the primary deity of the constellations, while Hainan was the deity of mornings and the New Age. The Tagalog cosmic beliefs is not exempted from the moon-swallowing serpent myths prevalent throughout the different ethnic peoples of the Philippines. But unlike the moon-swallowing serpent stories of other ethnic peoples, which usually portrays the serpent as a god, the Tagalog people believe that the serpent which causes eclipses is a monster dragon, called Leo, instead. The dragon, despite being strong, can easily be defeated by Mayari, the reason why the moon's darkness during eclipses is diminishes within minutes. Pag Aanito Offering or Act of Worship Topic. Because of the limitations of language and of personal religious biases, Spanish chroniclers often recorded different interpretations of Tagalog words relating to worship. The word, Anito, is one of these words which had differing interpreters. Scott notes that missionaries eventually reinterpreted the word to mean, all idols, including the Middle Eastern gods mentioned in the Bible, whenever they were included in their homilies. As a result, in modern times, the word, Anito has come to mean the various figurines or idols which represent Filipino deities. However, the Tagalog words for such representations was Larawan. In his 1613 dictionary Vocabulario de la Lengua Tagala, Fray Pedro de San Buenaventura explains, more appropriately would it be called an offering because Anito does not signify any particular thing, such as an idol, but an offering and the prayer they would make to deceased friends and relatives, or an offering made to anything they finished, like a boat, house, fishnet, etc., and it was mats, cooked food, gold, and other things. The unnamed author of the anonymous 1572, Relacion de la Conquista de la Isla de Luzon, Translated in Volume 3 of Blair and Robertson, while noted to be particularly hispanocentric and anti-nativist in his views, nevertheless provides a detailed description of the Tagalog's Pag Anito, which bears many apparent similarities to surviving indigenous practices. When any chief is ill, he invites his kindred and orders a great meal to be prepared, consisting of fish, meat, and wine. When the guests are all assembled and the feast set forth in a few plates on the ground inside the house, they seat themselves also on the ground to eat. In the midst of the feast called Manganito or Balan in their tongue, they put the idol called Batala and certain aged women who are considered as priestesses, and some aged Indians—neither more nor less. They offer the idol some of the food which they are eating, and call upon him in their tongue, praying to him for the health of the sick man for whom the feast is held. The natives of these islands have no altars nor temples whatever. 
This manganito, or drunken revel, to give it a better name, usually lasts seven or eight days, and when it is finished they take the idols and put them in the corners of the house, and keep them there without showing them any reverence. <laughs> Baithala. The Almighty, or Creator. According to the early Spanish missionaries, the Tagalog people believed in a creator god named Baithala, whom they referred to both as Malicha creator, lit. actor of creation, and Maykapal lord, or almighty, lit. actor of power. Lorca and Chirino reported that in some places, this creator god was called Malayari, Malyari or Diawata, Diwata. Scott 1989 notes, Baithala was described as May Kapal sa lahat maker of everything. Kapal meaning to mold something between the hands like clay or wax. Francisco Demetrio, Gilda Cordero Fernando, and Fernando Nakpil Zialcita summarize a number of Tagalog beliefs regarding Baithala. The Tagalogs called their supreme god Baithala Makapal or Lumika the creator. An enormous being, he could not straighten up due to the lowness of the sky. And the sun burned brightly near him. One day, Baithala got a bolo and pierced one of the sun's eyes so that it could generate just enough heat to sustain life. At last, Baithala was able to straighten up and with his hands pushed the cooler sky to its present level. Baithala is also known as the grand conserver of the universe, the caretaker of things from whom all providence comes, hence the beautiful word Bahala or Mabahala meaning to care. The missionaries who observed the Tagalog peoples in the 1500s noted, however that the Tagalogs did not include Baithala in their daily acts of worship Fray Buenaventura noted in the Vocabulario de la Lengua Tagala that the Tagalogs believed Baithala was too mighty and distant to be bothered with the concerns of mortal man, and so the Tagalogs focused their acts of appeasement to the immediate spirits which they believed had control over their day-to-day -day life. Other deities and powers Topic. Because Baithala was considered a distant entity, the Tagalog people focused their attention more on some scholars' term to be lesser deities and powers, which could be more easily influenced than Baithala. Because the Tagalogs did not have a collective word to describe all these spirits together, Spanish missionaries eventually decided to call them Anito. Since they were the subject of the Tagalog's act of Pag Anito worship. According to Scott, a careful search of sources from the 1500s reveals that there was no single word in Tagalog for the other deities to whom Baithala was superior. When necessary, Spanish lexicographers referred to them all as Anito. According to Scott, accounts and early dictionaries describe them as intermediaries, Bathala's agents, and the dictionaries used the word abogado. Advocate when defining their realms. These sources also show, however, that in practice, they were addressed directly. In actual prayers, they were petitioned directly, not as intermediaries. Scott cites the example of a farmer's prayer to Likapati, where a child would be held over a field, and the farmer would pray, Likapati, Pekanan mo yaring alipan mo, huwag mong gutaman, Likapati feed this thy slave, let him not hunger. Demetrio, Fernando and Zialcita, in their 1991 reader, The Soul Book, categorize these spirits broadly into ancestor spirits and non-ancestor spirits, but then further sub-categorize them into ancestor spirits, nature spirits, and guardian spirits. Topic. Tagalog spirits described in early first-hand accounts. Topic. Scott, drawing from first-hand accounts and descriptions in early dictionaries, describes some of these Tagalog spirits specifically Lakan Bakid was the lord of fences Bakid, and was invoked to keep animals out of Swidens. Scott quotes San Buenaventura as saying Lakan Bakid's Larawan image, idol, had gilded genitals as long as a rice stalk, and was offered eels when fencing Swidens, because, they said, his were the strongest of all fences. Amon Sinai was an ancestor spirit who was invoked by fishermen as a guardian spirit. Scott notes that he was 
the inventor of fishing gear, and was named when first wetting a net or fish hook. Likapati was were hipped in the fields at planting time, and was fittingly represented by a hermaphrodite image with both male and female parts. Aman Ikabli, the patron of hunters. Dian Masalanta, the patron of lovers and childbirth. Mankukudid, protector of coconut palms, given an offering by tuba tappers before climbing a tree, lest they fall from the trunk. Uwainan Sana, guardian of grasslands or forests, acknowledged as overlord of grasslands or forests whenever entering them, to avoid being regarded as trespassers. Lakambini, the advocate Spanish dictionaries used the term abogado of the throat, was invoked in case of throat ailments. Hake, the sea god, called upon by seamen in a major ceremony, asking for fair weather and favorable winds. Lesser deities like Linga and Bibit, who caused illness if not given recognition in the ordinary course of daily activities. Catalonan priests or priestess the priest or priestess of the Tagalogs and Kapampangans were called Catalonan, also spelled Catalonan, or Catalunan in Kapampangan, and was equivalent of the Visayan term Babalan. The term apparently springs from the Tagalog word Catalo, which means in good terms with, such that the Catalonan are those in good terms with the Anito spirits. Historian and Spanish missionary Pedro Chirino, S.J. noted that their long hair is a symbol of their commitment to their religion, although the many modern Filipinos mistakenly refer to any priest or priestess of the animistic pre-Hispanic Filipino religions as Babalan. Writer Nick Joaquin and historian William Henry Scott remind modern Filipinos that the independent cultural evolution of each Filipino ethnic group should be respected. Topic. Folk medicine. Topic. Tagalog folk medicine, some practices of which persist today and are studied under Filipino psychology, is strongly influenced by the religious cosmology of the Tagalog people. Aside from the indigenous herb lore which is common to forms of folk medicine throughout human society, among the overarching concepts within Tagalog folk medicine include the systems of USOG and of Inid at Lamig, hot and cold, which leads to PASMA. Tigmamanukan omen birds. Topic: The Tagalog people called the Tigmamanukan, a local bird, an omen bird. Although the behaviors of numerous birds and lizards were said to be omens, particular attention was paid to the Tigmamanukan. According to San Buenaventura's dictionary, the Tagalogs believed that the direction of a Tigmamanukan flying across one S path at the beginning a journey indicated the undertaking's result. If it flew from right to left, the expedition would be a success. This sign was called labe, a term still present in some Filipino languages with the meaning proceed. If the bird flew from left to right, the travelers would surely never return. It was also said that if a hunter caught a tigmamanukan in a trap, they would cut its beak and release it, saying kita i iwawala, kuna koi me kakanan, lalabe ka. Quote opening parenthesis quote. You are free, so when I set forth, sing on the right. While the name, Tigmamanukan, is no longer used today, some early Western explorers say that the specific bird referred to by the name is a fairy bluebird genus Irena, family Irenidae. One explorer specifically identified the Asian fairy bluebird Irena Puella Turcosa, while another specifically identified the Philippine fairy bluebird Irena cyanogastra. In any case, most of the sources which describe the Tigmamanukan agree that it is distinguished by a blue color. Topic: The Tagalog Anito and the Visayan Dewata. Topic. Demetrio, Cordero Fernando, and Nikpil Zialcita observed that the Luzon Tagalogs and Kapampangans use of the word Anito instead of the word Dewata, which was more predominant in the Visayan regions, indicated that these peoples of Luzon were less influenced by the Hindu and Buddhist beliefs of the Majapahit Empire than the Visayans were. 
They also observed that the words were used alternately amongst the peoples in the southernmost portions of Luzon, the Bicol region, Marinduque, Mindoro, etc. They suggested that this have represented transitional area, the front lines of an increased, Indianized Majapahit influence which was making its way north the same way Islam was making its way north from Mindanao. Topic. Tagalog Seoul Topic. The Tagalog people traditionally believe in the two forms of the soul. The first is known as the kakambal literally means twin, which is the soul of the living. Every time a person sleeps, the kakambal may travel to many mundane and supernatural places which sometimes leads to nightmares if a terrible event is encountered while the kakambal is traveling. When a person dies, the kakambal is ultimately transformed into the second form of the Tagalog soul, which is the kaluluwa literally means spirit. In traditional Tagalog religion, the Kaluluwa then travels to either Kasanan if the person was evil when he was living or Maka if the person was good when he was living. Both domains are ruled by Baithala, though Kasanan is also ruled by the deity of souls. Due to the arrival of the Spanish in the 16th century, Roman Catholicism was forcefully introduced to the Tagalog. In Roman Catholicism, a good person is sent to heaven while a bad person is sent to hell to burn in scalding oil. Topic. Dream beliefs Topic. The Tagalog people traditionally believe that when a person sleeps, he may or may not dream the omens of Baithala. The omens are either hazy illusions within a dream, the appearance of an omen creature such as Tigmamanukan, or sightings from the future. The dream omens do not leave traces on what a person must do to prevent or let the dream come true as it is up to the person to make the proper actions to prevent or make the dream come true. The omen dreams are only warnings and possibilities. Drafted by Baithala. Additionally, a person may sometimes encounter nightmares in dreams. There are two reasons why nightmares occur, the first is when the kakambal soul encounters a terrifying event while traveling from the body, or when a bangingo creature sits on top of the sleeping person in a bit of vengeance due to the cutting of her tree home. Majority of the nightmares are said to be due to the kakambal soul encountering terrifying events while traveling. Topic. Traditional burial practices Topic. The Tagalog people had numerous burial practices prior to Spanish colonization and Catholic introduction. In rural areas of Cavite, trees are used as burial places. The dying person chooses the tree beforehand, thus when he or she becomes terminally ill or is evidently going to die because old age, a hut is built close to the said tree. The deceased's corpse is then entombed vertically inside the hollowed-out tree trunk. Before colonization, a statue known as Lika is also entombed with the dead inside the tree trunk. In Mulané, Quezon and nearby areas, the dead are entombed inside limestone sarcophagi along with a Lika statue. However, the practice vanished in the 16th century due to Spanish colonization. In Calatagan, Batangas and nearby areas, the dead are buried under the earth along with Lika statues. The statues, measuring 6 to 12 inches, are personified depictions of Anitos. Lika statues are not limited to burial practices as they are also used in homes, prayers, agriculture, medicine, travel, and other means. Topic. Foreign influences Topic. Although the current scholarly consensus is that the roots of the Tagalogs beliefs were indigenous, or to be more specific, Austronesian, these beliefs were later enhanced by elements which the Tagalogs adapted from Hinduism, Mahayana Buddhism, and Islam. Although scholars acknowledge the possibility that some of these influences may have come through the limited trade the Tagalogs had with the Srivijaya, it is believed that most of the Hindu and Buddhist elements were incorporated as a result of the more extensive trade the Tagalogs later had with the Majapahit, while the Islamic influences were incorporated due to the Tagalog Majino class. Connections with the Sultanate of Brunei, and the Tagalogs' trading relations throughout Malaysia. Topic. Indirect Indian influences through the Majapahit topic. 
Because physical evidence regarding the degree to which India influenced the Philippines prior to the Spanish conquista is rather sparse, scholars have held differing views on this matter over the years. Jocano notes, "...except for a few artifacts and identified loanwords that have been accepted as proofs of Indian-Philippine relations, there are meagre intrusive materials to sustain definite views concerning the range of Indian prehistoric influence in the country." Many generalizations that have so far been advanced merely obscure the basic issues of Philippine cultural development. Even archaeological data, mostly trade items, must be critically evaluated before they are judged as evidence of direct contacts. He notes that the various streams of the evidence which support the assertion that this influence reached the Philippines include syllabic writing, artifacts in the form of different figurines made of clay, gold, and bronze that were dug in various sites in the Philippines, and 336 loanwords identified by Professor Francisco to be Sanskrit in origin, with 150 of them identified as the origin of some major Philippine terms." Regardless of how and when it actually happened, historiographers specializing in Southeast Asia note that this influence was cultural and religious, rather than military or political in nature. For example, Osborne, in his 2004 History of Southeast Asia, notes, beginning in the 2nd and 3rd centuries CE there was a slow expansion of Indian cultural contacts with the Southeast Asian region. It was an uneven process, with some areas receiving Indian influence much later than others, and the degree of influence varying from century to century. Indianization did not mean there was a mass migration of Indian population into sea. Rather, a relatively limited number of traders and priest scholars brought Indian culture in its various forms to Southeast Asia where much, but not all, of this culture was absorbed by the local population and joined to their existing cultural patterns. Osborne further emphasizes that this Indianization of Southeast Asia did not per se overwrite existing indigenous patterns, cultures, and beliefs. Because Indian culture came to Southeast Asia, one must not think that Southeast Asians lacked a culture of their own. Indeed, the generally accepted view is that Indian culture made such an impact on Southeast Asia because it fitted easily with the existing cultural patterns and religious beliefs of populations that had already moved a considerable distance along the path of civilization. Southeast Asians, to summarize the point, borrowed but they also adapted. In some very important cases, they did not need to borrow at all. Historiographers, both from Southeast Asia in general, and the Philippines specifically, agree that the impact of Indianization in Philippines was indirect in nature, occurring through contacts with the Majapahit culture. Orborn 2004 notes that Vietnam and the Philippines did not participate in the main wave of Indianization. In the case of Vietnam, who were in this period living under Chinese rule, the process of Indianization never took place. For a different reason, distant geographical location, neither did the Philippines participate in this process." Jocano furthers, "...the Philippines is geographically outside the direct line of early commerce between India and the rest of Southeast Asia. Moreover, the island world of Indonesia, with Sumatra and Java controlling the traffic of trade, functioned as a sieve for whatever influence cultural, social, and commercial India might have had to offer beyond the Indonesian archipelago. Thus, it can be said that Indian influence filtered into the Philippines only indirectly. After reviewing threads of evidence for the various views concerning the date and mechanism of Indian prehistoric influence in the country. Jokano concludes, Philippine Indonesian relations during precolonial times became intensified during the rise of the Majapahit Empire. It was during this time that much of the so called Indian cultural influence reached the Philippines through Indonesia. But what penetrated into our country, particularly in the seaport communities, was already the modified version of the original Hindu cultural traits. Fray Diego de Herrera noted that inhabitants in some villages were Muslim in name only, and Saborn also notes that the Luzones who visited Portuguese Malacca in the 1510s to 1540s were nominally Muslim. The unnamed author of the anonymous 1572 Relacion goes into further detail. 
In the villages nearest the sea some do not eat pork, the reason for their not eating it, which I have already given, being that, in trading with the Moros of Berni, the latter have preached to them some part of the nefarious doctrine of Mahoma, charging them not to eat pork when any of them are asked why they do not eat it, they say that they do not know why, and if one asks them who Mahoma was and what his law commands, they say that they do not know the commandment or anything about Mahoma, not even his name, nor do they know what his law is, nor whence it came. It is true that some of them who have been in Burney understand some of it, and are able to read a few words of the Al-Quran, but these are very few, and believe that he who has not been in Burney may eat pork, as I have heard many of them say. Present-day beliefs Modern-day scholars such as Scott, Jocano, and Magay, and theologians such as Gorospe agree that the indigenous religious beliefs of the Tagalog people persist even to this day, in the form of folk religion. For example, Almosera notes that, the encounter with Spanish Catoholic Christianity did little to change the worldview held by the pre-Hispanic Filipinos. It resulted, however, in the formation of a folk religion, namely Filipino folk Catholicism, a syncretistic form of which still exists. Scott, in his seminal 1994 work, Barangay, 16th Century Philippine Culture and Society, notes that there are striking similarities between accounts from the 1500s vis a vis modern folk beliefs today. He describes the account of Miguel de Lorca account, in particular, to be Remarkable in that it sounds like what is now called folk Catholicism. Catholic scholar Fr. Vitaliano R. Gorospe, meantime, notes, Even today, especially in the rural areas, we find merely the external trappings of Catholic belief and practice, superimposed on the original pattern of pre Christian superstitions and rituals. <laughs> Important teachers and writers Topic: Grace Nono, folkloristics. Grace Odal, folkloristics. Damiana Eugenio, folkloristics. Gilda Cordero Fernando, folkloristics. E. Arsenio Manuel, folkloristics. Isabelo de los Reyes, folkloristics. F. Landa Jocano, anthropology. William Henry Scott, historian, history and historiography. Virgilio Enriquez Philippine Psychology Juan Flavier Philippine Folk Medicine Michael Tan Philippine Folk Medicine Topic References Topic 